time for my virtual Jericho with John Mayer. Welcome. This building will change Greater Jericho beyond all of our imaginations. It's the new Schwartzman Humanity Centre, slap bang in the middle of the revamped Radcliffe Observatory Quarter. It's currently under construction and due for completion in autumn 2025. Now, this is the third My Jericho All About It. There will be academic offices there, an AI ethics centre, a concert hall, a theatre, bars, and it will open to the community. Let's have a quick look at the progress. So there we are. That's what will be in, in two years' time, in October 2025. Now, the man fronting the whole shebang for the university is Professor William White. He's Professor of Architect Architectural History, and he's a part-time vicar as well in, 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 in real life. William, how's it all going? It's all going very well. I mean, we are um, now nearly six months into the construction phase of the, of the building. We had our groundbreaking... Uh, at the end of January, and since then, the uh, team here from Lange Rourke have excavated thousands of tons of soil, have laid the groundwork and established the foundations for the building. They've been piling, they've piled down as deep as Everest is high, and uh, we should be on track to begin the actual process of constructing the superstructure, raising the building out of the uh, out of the ground um, by the end of this year, which will keep us on track to open uh, in autumn 2025, as you say. Let's have a little look. You made you made an instructive video about uh, uh, how the building has gone. Let's have a little look at that, and, and we'll take it in, and then we'll talk talk over it in a while. William, perhaps you could talk us through some of this. Yes, of course. So this is the stage that we've been experiencing uh, early this year, in which you see the pile drivers, in which you see great sort of concrete uh, base of the building being dug out, um, trucked up, as you see in the corners, in order to make room for the cultural spaces you were talking about, the 500-seater concert hall and all the rest. And this is what will start happening from the end of this year as the superstructure is raised, as the building um, gradually assumes its form. Uh, and then once we've reached that point, there'll be an exciting moment where the dome is uh, lifted on. And uh, we see, as you see, the facade being assembled around it. The uh, various elements that are going to enable it to be a passive house building are established. And then just towards the end of the process, the laying out of the landscapes, the establishing of these public gardens that people will be able to use. And this gives you a sense of what's happening. We've, we've seen all this. This is the, the stuff that's been happening. And we're about this stage. Well, we've whipped beyond the stage we're at. And so you can see on the left, the great huge four-story space for the, um, for the concert hall. In the centre, you can see the great hall opening up where the uh, cafe will be, the publicly accessible cafe will be, and then the humanities library, all the various humanities faculties on the upper floors, and then this huge, huge dome um, being assembled on top. It's going to involve, it's already involving hundreds of people working on site. It's going to involve thousands of people in the end, and that's cross-section. 
with the theatre on the right and the concert hall on the left. And here, here is the concert hall as it's uh, beginning to be constructed, even as we speak, on these anti-vibration mounts. The idea behind the concert hall is you can, what's called a box-in-box -box construction. So you have the concert hall itself and then a void between it and the outer shell of it so that it has complete acoustic separation, which will be what guarantees the world-class acoustic that we've been promising. So that's what's being assembled here with these huge uh, iron uh, girders and supports laying out that four-storey concert hall. which will then be filled, lined in wood and equipped with uh, what we hope is going to be exceptionally comfortable seat. And so we end up with that in the end. Okay, let's go, let's come back to you. What's gone right, right and what's gone wrong in, in the building? What's gone right is easier to answer than what's gone wrong. I mean, in terms of things going wrong, of course, you know, we've been building this uh, project against the backdrop of a succession of rather unpredicted and unpredictable events. So we, you know, we agreed to begin. We received the initial benefaction from our donor, Stephen Schwartzman, in 2019. And we would just appointed the architects and we're just undertaking the process of designing the building when lockdown happened. We emerged from lockdown only to find a period of hyperinflation in the building uh, industry. And of course, we've experienced the effects of the war in Ukraine. So there's been a backdrop of, of issues which have involved, you know, rising prices or uh, supply chain difficulties, which on the whole, well, in fact, we have overcome. We've, we've managed, to, we've managed to, to produce the building despite rather than because of the context in which we're doing it. What's gone right is that we've had this tremendous support from uh, the university and from our donor. We were already at the point in which the building began, the single largest uh, building project the university has ever constructed and the result of the single largest gift the university had ever received. That gift is now 185 million pounds. And so that's enabled us to continue work on the building. What's gone right is I have a fantastic team of people that I'm working with. You're about to meet one of them, my colleague, Jennifer McCreel from uh, the University of State Service. And what's also gone right, two other things, is that we've worked uh, extremely closely with a huge range of people, our contractors, Lang O'Rourke, our, our architects, Hopkins, and a, a, a fleet uh, of uh, consultants of various sorts. As I think I said last time I was on here, I have I have a vertical transportation consultant. I have a dome consultant. I have acoustic consultants. And we have gone to the best in the business for all these jobs. And I think the last thing, and this is where you've been really helpful, John, and where, where community groups in Jericho and beyond have been really helpful, is that we've had huge numbers of meetings with people. We've spent a lot of time listening to what... Um, community in Jericho, the community in Oxford is after, and we've had enormous help there from them, from the city council, from, from other people who are keen to do what we want to do, which is to build the first ever university building, which from the get-go is designed to be shared with the public. And the listening, has that made any difference? How have you changed as a result of that? I think the cre the critical thing, I mean, the critical thing with the, with the, with the, the, the way in which the building has been designed. It's been designed um, to be accessible. And that means that it's being designed so it feels welcoming. It feels like a civic building as much as a, a, as a university building and accessible in the broadest possible way. So we've listened really hard to people in the university and people beyond who've said what we want are not just, you know, good by quality academic and performance spaces. We also want spaces where people who are neurodivergent and need to get away from uh, noise can go. We are providing a, a, a changing uh, places space, which um, is, a, is, is a, a, will be one of only two in Oxford where people who have very high dependency needs can use the toilet and, and be supported in that. It'll have a, you know, 
the gardens have been designed in the assumption that they'll also be accessible. It's completely accessible throughout. There's wheelchair access to everything for people who use wheelchairs, that sort of sense. I think the other thing is that um, we will keep be conscious that this is a very big building project. And so what we've set ourselves, the challenge of doing is to build it to passive house standards, the sort of highest environmental standards we can. And we've kept that because that was an undertaking we gave. We've kept that as a, as a core uh, principle for the building, um, you know, no matter what, so that we have always, always made that a, a critical a critical criterion in making decisions, even when it costs more, even when it uh, would be easier not to do that in some respects. So those are sort of, sort of ways in which we've done it. I think more generally, more generally, in deciding what this building would contain, what would be the facilities we'd provide. We wanted to provide facilities that various cultural groups in the city have said will be useful. We've also wanted to provide facilities that are going to add to Oxford and not compete with what's already here. Um, and so we've been working very hard. Um, and my colleague, John Full James, who's the uh, head of the cultural programme for the humanities, has been working extremely hard to engage with um, cultural partners in the city to make sure that what we're doing with this building is adding something that doesn't exist and adding something that we hope will attract people to Oxford and so make a positive contribution and not, not be in any sense a kind of rival to the Pegasus, the fire station, to the new theatre, to, to, to the playhouse. So what will be in that cultural programme? Can you give us a, a hint in yeah, so the idea behind the cultural program is really it's going to serve three different constituencies in all sorts of ways and sort of, in a way, bring together um, these these different constituencies. It's clearly it's part of the humanities division. It's it's it, it grows out of um, stuff that already exists. It grows out of Torch, the Oxford Research Centre in the humanities. It grows out of the work that's been done um, to... Um, work with communities in Oxford and beyond to see how the humanities is, is, is relevant to modern life in all sorts of ways. It's also, of course, part of the part of the, the cities, um, what, uh, what uh, John always describes as the city's sort of cultural ecosystem. But, but really ambitiously, it's meant to be making a contribution to, to global debates about what it is to be human, to um, attract global artists who come and perform here and in that sense you know not just animate the center but also actually make oxford even more of a more of a center for the arts more of a center for culture and opening up the exciting kind of cultural uh, cultural events that oxford already does to an even wider audience so you know one could imagine for example, we have this suite of performance and exhibition spaces. We are linked to the uh, work of the Bodleian, of the Ashmolean, of the other museums. We're part of that wider uh, cultural world in Oxford. You could imagine you know, a season on Japan, say, in which we put on Japanese music in the concert hall, we put on Japanese theatre in the theatre, we can put on Japanese cinema in the cinema, exhibition of Japanese art in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in our gallery. And that that's also linked to other exhibitions in the Ashmolean, in the old fire station, performances in the playhouse, things at Modern Art Oxford. So you start to get you start to get something that's going to draw in not just the people of Oxford, that's really critically important for the university, but actually you begin to become a destination for people across the world who are wanting to explore culture and wanting to explore ideas. You become a fulcrum for cultural life in, in Oxford. Yeah? Exactly. yeah, that's the ambition. That's, that's the hope. Now, what will the ordinary man or woman in in the Albert Street in Albert Street in Jericho find to go to in 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 your new building? Well, ordinary I mean, working we class do. people. Sorry, sorry, John. Ord, or, or, or ordinary working class folk living in a ter terrace in Albert Street. What will they yeah. What will they find to go to? Well, I mean, the, the building, the building, uh, and its surroundings are, are going to be open to everyone uh, from nine in the morning to nine at night every day. Uh, and the gardens, of course, will be open. Will be open all the time. So, I mean, in a sense, 
particularly the landscaping is something that everyone will have there. It'll be part of the, you know, the kind of greening of Jericho that uh, has been so successful over the last the last few years. Inside, we hope people will come and uh, use our cafe. Indeed, the whole the whole building rests upon the fact that people are going to buy you know, buns and coffee in, in what we hope is going to be a very attractive cafe. We hope people are going to come and use the bar. Indeed, the humanities division is, uh, you know, largely going to be kept afloat on gin in that sense. What will be available there? The idea is to offer the widest range of cultural experiences. So, you know, some days, some days it will be, uh, you know, a big, a big concert, um, you know, of I don't know, Bach or Bird or, or something Beethoven. Um, some days we'll be doing comedy. Some days you can imagine that there'll be uh, jazz. Some days um, we can do more. We can do more popular music. It's equipped so we can put on musical theatre. And also the spaces. The spaces are incredibly adaptable, so that you can do a variety of things. We're really excited about the possibility, for example, of that great hall, that huge domed space at the heart of the building. Well, I mean, that's the size of the Radcliffe camera. And that's equipped so we can put on concerts there, we can put on stand-up comedy, we can put on, you know, rather spectacular events. The hope is that what we'll be able to do, John will come and talk to you, John Full James will come and talk to you later in the year about his much more fully worked out ideas of what the, uh, the programme will be, but we'll be able to put on something for everyone. No, there won't be something there for will- everyone every night. But there will be a huge variety of different activities that means that, you know, ideally, people will not only come to see things they know they're going to like, see names that they recognise, but also they'll start to regard this as a place where they can go and experiment. They can go and try things they've never even heard of before. So will you replace the Harcourt for music and and, and, and the other music pubs in Jericho? No, because it's... Of- it, 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 It's a very different, very different venue from it's not a pub. I mean, a pub is going to a pub has all sorts of uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, cultures, all sorts of um, attractions that, that, that we don't have. We'll be we'll be able to we'll be able to provide other things. And that's what's so good about it being in Jericho is they're already it's already quite a lot going on. It's. What's good about it being in Oxford is that most nights you can find something in Oxford that uh, that somebody will want to go and go and see. I, the idea is this adds rather than replaces. And so, yeah, you know, the bar, the bar is equipped so you can go there and you can hear somebody doing, you know, little jazz quartet can play there whilst you whilst you have a drink or something like that. But that's that's going to feel very different and be rather different from you know, dropping into the Harcourt Arms or going to Joe's in Summertown or heading down the Cowley Road to to, to, to go to a gig down there. No, no, you, you mentioned the bar. I've never, not seen a presentation where you've not majored on the bar. I know, I know. Tell us a bit more about it. Will it be open to the public all the time? Yes, I mean, the, the bar will be open to the public whenever the bar is open. Um, the, the, the kind of decision about what that, that will be, the decision about what the licence will be, that's, that's, that's yet to be taken. But it will be, the idea is that this will be a, a building for everyone. But so, you know, there may be a moments where it has to be closed off for one reason or another. But the, 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 the goal is that everyone will feel at home here. Let's, let's talk about the intellectual, the AI and Ethics um, oh. Institute. Tell us a bit about that. So this was one of the very exciting things. So the, the gift that was given to us in, in, in 2019 comprised three elements. The largest single element was, was the building itself. But there was also uh, uh, the cultural programme that we've just been talking about and also the establishment of this new centre for ethics and AI, which is um, headed by John Tasoulis, who's a very distinguished legal philosopher and the committee of which is uh, is managed uh, is is headed up by Nigel Shadbolt, the principal of Jesus, and uh, already some, somebody who's been world recognised in in AI um, for, for, for decades, in fact. Uh, and you know, in 2019, that looked like an interesting thing to do, and it looked like a sort of forward thinking thing to do. 
Um, what's been happening, uh, as you know, is that in Stanford and Berkeley and places like that is lots of work's been done on AI. MIT, lots of work is being done on AI. And they're just having to think retrospectively about how they, how they retrofit ethics into, into artificial intelligence. The idea behind this was that, you know, here would be a place where Oxford could get ahead of those other other international competitor universities and start to think about ethics from the get-go as the AI is being developed, indeed in advance of major developments in, in AI. Of course, what's happened in the last year or so is that the um, that, 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 that decision has, has come to seem strikingly prescient, as we've seen that AI, which looked as though it was decades off, is in fact already changing how people live and work. And it's changing it before people have had a chance to think about what the ethical consequences of that are. So what we're doing in the Centre for Ethics in AI, and it's, it's brilliantly positioned here um, next to the Blavatnik, where you have people working on the governance of artificial intelligence, next to maths, where you have people who are actually working on artificial intelligence. The idea is that this will become an international centre uh, for research, uh, but also for discussions, for wider discussions about it. And one of the exciting things about the building is that the ground floor of the building is a centre for public engagement on ethics and AI. And the idea is not that people should be going away and thinking about the ethical consequences of artificial intelligence in some, you know, ivory tower, or in this case, in a kind of Clipsham stone uh, tower, but rather that this should be a, a space where people from all over the world, but also from within Oxford, can come together and think about what a future, uh, what the world will look like uh, once uh, AI has become more widely embedded, but also what the world should look like. What are the things we ought to be doing? What are the questions we ought to be asking? What are the policies that we ought to be implementing in order to make sure that AI is a tool to help us rather than, as has been suggested, you know, multiple times in recent weeks, as something rather dangerous or frightening? Isn't there a danger, William, you will have missed the boat there? Because AI is very, very hot at the moment and it's getting hotter and hotter by, by the day. And you, you won't have until 2020, 2025. Why don't you set up a port academy for this little centre and, and start now? Well, actually, the Centre for Ethics in AI already exists um, and is recruiting recruiting um, heavily at the moment. And John Tasoulis, who actually would be somebody worth getting on on uh, my virtual Jericho to talk about is already engaged in those kind of conversations. He's already mm. set up in a little temporary base um, just off just off Parks Road. The idea is that um, you know it will be by the time the building opens, his project will already be you know five five six years underway, and this will just give it a further boost to what's already very exciting work and and very very publicly recognisable work. I mean, you'll have seen. You'll have seen stuff. I mean, there was a you know, he's, he's constantly in demand in the media because he's seen rightly as not just a, a leading figure in in thinking about AI, but also as one of the sort of you know most you know most original, but also most level-headed figures in saying, look, let's go back and think hard, not just about what we can do, but what we ought to do when it comes to artificial intelligence. Will that be your flagship intellectual uh, centre, do you think? Well, we, we, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, you know, in a sense, what we've got in this building is, I mean, that's one of two major research centres. The other major research centre, which I should have mentioned, is um, the Oxford Internet Institute, which is, you know, for the last quarter of a century has been has been thinking about um, you know internet policy IT policy and so on and so forth and that's that's a big and very well established institute that will be moving in but of course when you've got you know seven different academic faculties running from theology to modern languages from history to English to linguistics when you've got seven different uh, academic libraries being merged into one place when you're building a building that's got I don't know over a thousand desk spaces for academics to work in, over 80 seminar and classrooms for teaching to uh, go on. I mean, I think it would be, I think it'd be 
you know, unfair and, and, and actually wrong to single out any one of those as the intellectual fulcrum, the real excitement of the building is the fact that what we're doing is we're taking all these disparate, different groups who are currently very ill-housed in 20 different buildings across the uh, across the city and bringing them together into this, this beautiful new home equipped with all the latest and, and, and uh, uh, most sophisticated technology in an environment that we hope is going to be conducive to thought. And what we're saying is go away and, you know, think, go away and discuss and also go away and see how what you're thinking in your in your lecture rooms, what you're thinking in your classrooms, what you're thinking in your 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 your, your offices, how, how that relates to the cultural programme, how that relates to a, a wider public who are going to be sharing this space with you. Tell us a bit about the Amalgamated Library and about the Bait Museum of Musical Instruments. Where is that going to sit in the new building? So the library and the bait collection are at the north. So as you come past the um, come past the Radcliffe Observatory, you go straight in um, and you you pass under the great uh, the great windows of the Bodleian Humanities Library, and then immediately to your left. I should say, actually, immediately to your right is another cafe. I shouldn't ever forget the opportunity to plug our coffee. But on the, immediately on the left is the bait collection. The library is, um, you know, as I say, bringing together seven currently disparately rather poorly housed collections. So the core collection of it is, is, is English, but the, the, uh, philosophy, theology, history of medicine, uh, internet policy some linguistics and so on, music is going to be uh, brought into this into this library. Um, and then beneath it is the Bait Collection, which is really one of Oxford's jewels. Um, and one of, one of, it's a jewel, but it's not a jewel that very many people know. The Bait Collection, which is currently housed under the Faculty of Music, which is itself currently housed in what was uh, the pre- predecessor for St Catherine's College, just to the south of Cromwell Church and to the north of the police station on St Aldate's. The Bait Collection is one of the world's most important collections of musical, of historic musical instruments. And the great excitement of the Bait, which is what distinguishes it from almost any other major collection of musical instruments, is that not only are people encouraged to play them, but there is actually a requirement that these are not just stuck in cases, but these are these are used. So they are used by music students. They're used by visiting um, uh, musicians, by scholars in music history. And part of the excitement of um, moving it to the uh, to the Schwarzman Centre is not just that it's going to become better known because it'll be right at the front of, uh, of the new building, but also that we can use it more. So that we've been talking about the way in which, you know, lunchtime, you know, it would be exciting to have people who are working on 18th century violins to take 18th century violins out of the case, to take them into the Great Hall and do a free lunchtime recital for people who want to come and listen to beautiful music, beautiful 18th century music as they have, a, as they have their lunch. Now, what about Jericho? How will I recognise Jericho in the building? Let me give you an, an idea for free. If you've been down Walton Street and Cranham Street, you've seen the history of Lucy's on the hoardings, which is a brilliant display. Why don't you find a home for that? And, 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 and it's, it's cost them a lot of money, and it'll disappear in, in a few weeks' time when the building opens. How will, how will, how will I find Jericho in, in your centre? It's a really good question. So, I mean, some of it's going to be formal. We, we are commissioning... Um, you know, interpretation boards, as they're called, which will be set up in the in the gardens to try and tell to try and tell two two key stories really about about the site that we're building on. The first and um, perhaps the best known of those stories, perhaps the most important of those stories, of course, is the story of the Radcliffe Infirmary. Is the fact that this is built on the site of what was Oxford's main hospital for the best part of 200 years, and that this is a place where people were born, this is a place where people died, this is a place where people were healed, where, you know, in the, the, there isn't a space at the moment, apart from a sort of, you know, that memorial plaque on the front of the, of the original infirmary building where that story is being told. And we want to tell that story. The other story, which is much less well known, is about the prehistory of Jericho. 
facts about the fact that this site was a, a, a contained a set of Bronze Age henges, which is part of a kind of um, prehistoric field system of henges that stretch all the way from Jericho down to the university parks with one enormous henge uh, under what's now Keeble College. And so we want to try and tell the early history of Jericho there too. That's the formal way in which um, in which we'll we'll try and tell the story of Jericho, in which we'll try and relate it to the community. More informally, the critical success of this building will lie in the fact that the people of Jericho feel that it's theirs and that it is somewhere where you can go and get a coffee or you can go and just read a book, or where you can go and listen to some nice music over lunchtime or you can go to a comedy gig or, or, or at the weekend. Um, there's a space in the building which is set aside for schools work. And so um, you know, there's, a, there's a general programme, there's a huge amount of work done in the universities and the colleges to try and encourage people from as wide a range of backgrounds to apply to Oxford to, to students. But there's also space here, you know, I'm hoping that there's going to be work done with the local primary schools, that they will they will come in and use this, that they will come in and feel this is part of their world. And also that local theatre groups, local, um, local musical groups, that they will also come and use the space. So that one of the ways in which it will be Jericho is because the people of Jericho inhabit it. Will you set up a little mini series of talks? You might even call it my Jericho, William. You know, some some along, and and uh, will you flog my Jericho book as well? In, in, of course, in your of course, cafe? of course. Yes. Yes. No, 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 I mean that's, that's the sort book. of thing. That, and indeed, an entirely excellent book. Um, uh, but that's exactly the sort of thing that we're hoping to do. I mean, my own department, the history faculty, is moving in this. We've. Uh, into this building, we've we've got a community historian. We're doing a lot more work. Um, you know, I chair the Oxford Preservation Trust and the Oxford Historical Society in the Victoria County History of Oxfordshire. So I'm part of that group of people who are trying to do more local history, more work with uh, local communities in telling their history, and also in providing spaces so that local groups can tell their own stories, so that they can relate their own history. I mean, that will be one of the key signs that we're working is that we're, we're putting on these events and that local people are coming along, listening to the story, buying your book and, uh, and also um, buying something at our bar. Or coffee. And, and, sure. tea and, and now a couple more questions. You've got an Achilles heel, of course, imposed upon you by, by the City Council. It's called parking. Mm. Have, you, have you thought your way through that one yet? How, how are we going to do it? Well, I mean, we, are, we, we have no parking on site. We wouldn't be allowed to have any parking on site. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure increasing the amount of parking um, in central Oxford would be would be widely widely welcomed. One of the attractions of this site is, of course, that it isn't that far away from parking in Gloucester Green in the evening, parking in, in, in St Giles. But more more importantly, of course, it's it's next to bus stops. It's within a walking good walking distance of, of the of the station. In terms of the parking, um, you know. What are we going to do to manage parking? That happily is not my 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 responsibility, but I know that the people whose responsibility it is, and that's the that's the humanities division, that there's there's work underway um, to 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 think about the transport management plan to to develop um, protocols and processes that will will ensure that this is not, and I think that must be what's uh, underlying your question, that this is not going to become a nuisance for the people of Jericho, that this is not going to mean that the streets are filled with people who've driven to the Schwarzman Centre and uh, taking up residence parking. The word on the street is that people will be driving round around Jericho in the early evening look, looking for spaces to park, and if there aren't any, how is that going to be managed? Well, I think the question there, we just, and that's an issue of communication more than anything else. And that's something that they've got to work on is it's, it's, it's transparently clear that there is not room in Jericho for parking. And we need to make that clear to everyone who comes to the centre so that, you know, actually the best thing they could do is park at the park and ride and get the, tr and get the bus in, which stops just outside 
um, we can we we we've got to work on, and that's something that I know there's a whole other project that's being run by um, the divisional registrar from Humanities, uh, Alex Vincent, on what we call building in use. And I know that tr- parking, I know that transport, I know that that sort of communication is a really, really important part of that. And we, we'll be able to tell you more. I think she'll be able to tell you more um, with, within, the, within the next year or so, well in time for the uh, centre to open. So have you thought about subcontracting? I mean, OUP's car park is empty at night. So quite yeah, often... We, 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 you, 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 you suggested that to me before, and that is something I have passed on to the division, um, alongside all the other suggestions we've received about ways in which ways in which parking can be managed. Good. Jennifer, explain who you are and what you do in the university, please. Uh, so I'm Jennifer McCreel. Uh, I am the project director from the university's estate services. Uh, I lead the technical team delivering the project. Uh, and uh, I am also the deputy head of capital projects within estate services at the university. So you're charged with making this happen, with effectively building it, right? Yes, so it, it, it's. Uh, it, I mean, it's a team effort for sure. But I lead the technical team, so I lead a team of project managers and cost consultants, and uh, and in turn, we have then our contractors and our um, design consultants that are working to us as well. Now, what was the original budget and what's it become? Oh, well, things that are uh, very challenging questions. We we did receive a, an initial donation from Stephen Schwartzman of $150 million, um, and he's been extraordinarily generous and extended that to $185 million to reflect the level of quality of the build that, that he envisaged and that we shared, um, but also to uh, help to address some of the challenges of inflation. Um, and the the uh, hyperinflation that we've all been uh, experiencing has hit the construction industry particularly hard, um, and our costs have gone up since the original donation of two was uh, given in two thousand and nineteen. So, what's going to be the final cost at outturn? I mean, we we all know about HS two. How much do you think you'll build it for? Well, much less than HS two. Um, I can uh, tell you that um, we do have a, a very strict budget control, and of course, we've got lots of degrees of commercial confidentiality. Um, but uh, we 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 have our generous donation that we're working to, um, and uh, and that's that's where it is that I'll leave that, John. Are you going to run out of money, John? I, I I can I can tell you that I have the best people working on this to make sure that we don't. Okay, now there's been a bit of controversy over the way it's financed. I mean, some people, not me, have said it's dirty money. You shouldn't take all this money from from a donor. What's your view on that? I think that the university has been incredibly um, lucky to to have so many wonderful benefactors give money to to it for a multitude of things. Um, Stephen Schwartzman's gift here has been incredibly generous. Um, and I think that without those kinds of gifts, the university would not necessarily have the ability to be uh, world class in some of its facilities. Um, it's not uh, it, it's not cheap to build these buildings um, to the standard that the university as a world class institution um, is. And, and, and I think that uh, we are very fortunate that we've had so many generous benefactors in the past. Is the university putting any money in, into this project apart from your time? Mm-hmm. Well, the university is very, very supportive of this project. Um, and of course, there's a lot of ways that the university is supporting it through finances. But um, I think that for the most part, um, we are very heavily reliant on on our uh, on our very generous benefactor. So you're getting a wonderful new building uh, financed by a, 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 an American benefactor, correct? By and large. That's it. Yeah. Now, there is controversy, obviously, also over the naming of buildings, uh, the Sackler Library, for example, and the, the disaster has been over Sackler. How, how are you going to cope with that if it turns out that uh, um, Stephen Schwartzman turns out to have a, 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 a backstory that nobody knows about? Well, the good thing is, is that Stephen Schwartzman is a wonderful man, and uh, we've done a lot to make sure that um, through the process of vetting that the university has, that uh, all of our our donors are appropriately selected. Um, the university doesn't accept money from every, just everyone. 
um, it has a thorough vetting process. Um, and, uh, and we're very grateful for Mr. Schwartzman's donation. So, so there, there, there are no skeletons in the cupboard as far as you know? No, no opioid? Uh... Okay, no no, okay, Stephen, Stephen Schwartzman is, is a is a very is a is a is a wonderful philanthropist, and we're very grateful to have him involved in our project. Okay, I um, wonder if um, we, we we can finally go, go back to William. Will, William, at, at the end at the end of the day, if you'd like to reposition the camera for you, what 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 Absolutely. we're saying when this building opens in in, in October twenty twenty five, you've got a, you've got an actual date, haven't you? October twenty ninth. Well, 29th of September uh, is, is, is meant to be the day that they hand over the key to us. Um, it's a day that uh, it's a day I find easy to remember because it's, it's my birthday. And also with an extraordinary uh, synchronicity, it's also Jennifer's birthday. So in that sense, we are wholly committed to the 29th of September 2025. It's the day the university gets the key. Won't be necessarily the day that the the building is opened, but it will be the day that the uh, it will be the day that we are able to take control of it and start getting it ready, so that we can welcome staff, students, and 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 locals um, thereafter. Have you booked the king to to, to open it? Who, who have you booked to open it? We haven't booked anyone as yet. I mean, if the king would like to, we'd be absolutely delighted to, to to welcome him. I think the exciting thing about the building is that we are going to have several openings. We will have an opening for the academic new year in uh, in, in in the autumn of twenty five. We'll have openings for civic leaders. We'll have openings for um, the local schools. We'll have openings for you um, and for, for 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 the people of Jericho. And we will be don't, building. Don't, 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 don't make a fuss of me. I'm I'm too modest. No. All right, but yeah, will no, I be? No, will no. I be? We'll, we'll have you install open. your book in the library. You know, yeah, we'll have a. Thank you. And will there be a grand opening? As, as sort of and there'll place. be a very grand opening. What it will do is it will take a while. So we have this, particularly with the concert hall, we have this amazing concert hall that we'll be building. Our acousticians, who are Arab, who are the kind of, you know, ne plus ultra of all acoustics experts, they, their, their strong advice is that what one does is that one has a kind of process of tuning that space. <laughs> Although we, although we have a good sense of, of what it will sound like, we have a good sense of how it will work, until it's actually there, until you've actually got people playing in it, you won't know what, if any, alterations need to be made. So what will happen is that we'll have a series of concerts, a series of events, a series of you know, musicals and things like that, which will, will get used to the acoustic of the space, and that will allow us to build up to the point that at some point, probably summer 26, we will have the grand opening with the first, you know, um, uh, major concert stage there and um, host of community events. Um, so there, there won't be a grand Christmas concert in... in, in, in Not in, in 25, but in six, we would hope there would be. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay, my last question. Now, you know, you, we're all mortal and you, you're, going to, you're going to die one day. What will it? What will it say? Uh, what will it say in your gravestone about you and you and the Schwartzman Centre? What would you like? The Ooh, well, I mean, yes, I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, I think it could easily say he gave five, six, seven years of his life to the Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre, um, and you know, I think it'd be worth it. It's it's an amazing project, as Jennifer was saying. It's a it's a, a really exciting thing to be involved in what is the single largest building the university has ever has ever seen but but more than that it's really exciting to be doing something that is intended to change the way the university operates this is designed to show and to be a building that is shared with the community and that's that's really exciting it's 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 really transformative it's something that other universities have done some successfully, others less so, and it's something that the University of Oxford ought to have been doing for decades, for centuries really, rather than building great buildings that have enormous doors and signs that say keep off the grass. What we are doing is we're building a building that we hope will not only transform our intellectual life, not only transform our cultural life, but actually in a way show other parts of the university that they should be more open than they are already. 
Okay, let's uh, conclude by having a look at what we saw at the beginning. Let's have a look at what's going to be. Let's have a look at the tape of what it will be like when you've done yes. your work. Uh, just to just to conclude, to say that uh, um, even even the JCB diggers have University of Oxford written on them on on that site. I've I've, no, I've noticed. Um, thank you, thank you for watching. Um, this that's the end of uh, my joker for this year. Anyway, but uh, ne next autumn we've got an exciting program lined up. We've got the University Vice Chancellor no less coming along. We've we've got Annie Sloan. We've got um, Professor Danny Dolan. We've we, 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 we'll have some stars. Clive Murray may be coming to do a turn at the end of July, and then we'll be we're chasing the stars like Florence Pugh and, and, and Anthony Armstrong, the people you see walking their dog uh, in, in, in the Woodstock Road will wander into St. Barnabas or similar. But thank you for watching, and thank you to both of you. Good, goodbye. Yeah.